Good morning, everyone. My name is Rama Luru from SDSP. I'm honored to introduce our next group of distinguished speakers. Please help me welcome the Honorable Dr. Robert Gates, the 22nd United States Secretary of Defense, the Honorable Dr. Leon Panetta, the 23rd United States Secretary of Defense, the Honorable Dr. Condoleezza Rice, the 66th United States Secretary of Defense uh, State, and Sir Alex Younger, the 16th Chief of MI6. For a conversation on innovation, geopolitics, and grand strategy. And we are thrilled to have Tom Shanker, Director of the Project for Media and National Security, moderate this discussion. His new book, Age of Danger, is published today. Over to you, Tom. Good morning. It's my distinct pleasure to welcome you to today's first panel on innovation, geopolitics, and grand strategy with a truly remarkable group of leaders and public servants. Secretary Gates, Secretary Panetta, and Secretary Rice are joining us very early from the West Coast, and Sir Alex Younger is joining us from the UK. The military has a term of art, which is the force multiplier effect, and that's what we have today. You may see four panelists on the screens, but we really have many, many more people than that. The wisdom of double that. We have two former defense secretaries, two former CIA directors, a former secretary of state, a former national security advisor, a former director of the Office of Management and Budget, and a former chief of the UK Secret Intelligence Service, MI6, and that's just their more recent positions. The fundamental premise of this panel is that, number one, the age of exponential technological change is here. Two, that geopolitics have returned with a vengeance, if indeed they ever left. And three, that there has never been a greater need for grand strategy, thoughtful grand strategy, on the part of the United States and its allies. So we're eager to hear some of the best thinking from some of the best thinkers from our panelists this morning. Welcome to all of you and thank you for joining us. To begin the discussion, I'd like to start with Russia's war of aggression against Ukraine. Same question for each of the four panelists. What are your expectations of the Ukrainian counteroffensive? And where do you think the trajectory of the war is headed now? And to quote the famous wartime question, tell us how this ends. We'll go alphabetically if I could. Secretary Gates, the floor is yours, sir. Thanks, Tom, and it's a pleasure to be with you all and with my, uh, with my fellow panelists. Um, I think a lot depends, obviously, on the counteroffensive that the Ukrainians are planning. Uh, they have been at pains the last uh, few weeks to try and downplay expectations. I think they felt you know, those were getting out of hand in terms of, uh, of what the counteroffensive uh, might accomplish. I, I think there's a general view that um, for there to be any chance of a, of a negotiated outcome here, uh, there has to be success in this counteroffensive. And, and it doesn't mean uh, knocking out the Russian army. It means uh, being able to take back the territory, particularly in the south, and it gives the Ukrainians access to the Sea of Azov and, and so on. Putin's primary uh, view of this is that he can outlast the Ukrainians the Europeans and the United States, that, uh, that he, he has to continue this at this point and that he will uh, do whatever is necessary. He's mobilized the uh, Russian economy now to uh, support this war. <clears throat> so I don't, I don't see even a uh, significant setback in the East as uh, leading him uh, to quit. So the question is, uh, will the Ukrainians be successful enough that there can be some kind of a Negotiated outcome, uh, or is a frozen conflict the more likely outcome of, of, a, of a hot peace, if you will, uh, sort of what we had between 2014 and 2022? Um, I'll just wrap up by simply saying, <clears throat> again, I think a lot depends on, on the counteroffensive. Uh, we shouldn't have uh, exaggerated expectations, but it is very important uh, in terms of the next. Uh, six months to a year, uh, 
um, that the Ukrainians make some serious progress, and particularly in the South. Thank you. Secretary Panetta, the floor is yours, sir. Uh, thank you, Tom, and uh, great to be with my uh, colleagues on this panel uh, and friends. Uh, also want to express my thanks to all those that have uh, put this forum together on behalf of Ash Carter. Uh, Ash was somebody who was a dear friend, a uh, great, uh, great public servant, uh, and someone we miss uh, deeply. So uh, thank you all for doing this in his memory. It's very appropriate. Uh, I don't uh, don't disagree with my friend uh, Bob Gates, uh, whose uh, summary uh, pretty much touches the key points. Uh, obviously, this is going to the course of this war is going to depend a great deal on what happens with uh, these offensives and whether or not uh, the Ukrainians can put together an effective uh, offensive uh, and be able to push the Russians back. Because the key here is not to get into a prolonged stalemate. Uh, that favors Putin, and that's basically what Putin's hoping for, is that this war can be prolonged uh, and uh, that ultimately the will of both uh, the United States and our allies uh, will somehow be broken. Uh, and so it's very important that uh, the United States and our allies do everything we can to support the Ukrainians in this offensive. Uh, I'm a little concerned that it's taken a while because uh, obviously in any offensive, surprise is a key factor. Uh, and I'm afraid we're losing the element of surprise here. Uh, they'll, they'll have to do diversions. They'll have to do what they can to try to uh, at least uh, force the Russians to anticipate where this offensive is coming from. Uh, so I, I would hope that they would move as, as fast as possible to be able to put this offensive into action. Uh, it is very critical that they are able to be successful. Uh, for how long, uh, we don't know, but uh, initially I think it's very important that they be seen as having put together a very successful offensive that is pushing the Russians back. Why? Because ultimately that's the key as to whether or not uh, you either force Putin to withdraw or to negotiate. Uh, and that, that is something I think everybody wants right now in terms of this war, because uh, the longer this goes on, uh, the more concerned we all are about uh, the, the, the trajectory uh, that this war is going to take. So the hope is that they, they are successful, that they put together an offensive, that we provide the weapons necessary for them to conduct that offensive, and that ultimately... Uh, it forces some kind of negotiated settlement that will resolve this war. Thank you. Uh, Secretary Rice, please. Well, I completely agree with the analysis of both uh, uh, Bob and Leon. And let me just say also, uh, I think we all had enormous respect for Ash Carter and thank, thank you again for, uh, for doing this. Um, I, I do completely agree. I just want to add one thing, which is that when one looks at Putin's calculus, um, there's no doubt that he understands now that the overthrow of the Ukrainian government is not at hand. But I do believe he thinks he can drag this out and that he will ultimately, quote, unquote, win. And I might note that, you know, we had the May 9th um, anniversary yesterday, the celebrations uh, in Moscow, Victory Day. And uh, his speech was kind of interesting because he's now redefining the whole thing as a war against Russia which suggests to me that he's uh, trying to tell the Russian people that they're in this for the long haul. And uh, whatever that bizarre incident was over the Kremlin with the drone, um, suggests to me that um, either there's somebody inside or they were simply trying to set up a false flag. So uh, they are trying to now say, it's not about Ukraine, it's about Russia. And that's a different message than uh, we had uh, earlier, early on. Thank you. Sir Alex. Uh, well, look, um, thank you. Uh, thank you for inviting us today to this very important conversation. Um, my surname begins with Y. It's held me back through most of my career. Um, so uh, there are most of the sandwiches in this conversation have already been eaten. But um, I would just add briefly three Three things. First of all, I, I agree that the objective needs to be to persuade Putin that time isn't on his side, where he currently thinks it is, but there needs to be a sufficiently 
significant degree of political success for him to understand that his uh, political survival is threatened. Uh, and uh, it's difficult to describe what that would actually mean in practice, breaking through to the sea or otherwise. But, but I think the aim is clear. Secondly, I think that the Ukrainians are going to have their work cut out. Um, uh, Russian um, objectives have consolidated to the defense of the ground they've already taken. A uh, you know, significant retrenchment of their initial ambition. Uh, they've dug holes and they've poured concrete like there's no tomorrow. And this is an easier military task than they set themselves up. In that context, degrading their logistic chain is absolutely fundamental to the prospects for success. And I can only echo the um, entreaties that we um, continue, particularly the United States, who have been so extraordinarily steadfast in providing the long range weapons necessary to degrade the logistics that will underpin this defense. And thirdly, this is a philosophical point, but it's relevant to the rest of this conversation is the Ukrainians must play to their strengths. This, in the end, it's an ideological confrontation, but it's also a confrontation of, of approach. And it's the centralized version, Russia's version, as against the decentralized version, Ukraine's version, and the genius it is shown for innovation. I think it's really important that they play to that ground. Um, their, their genius so far has been the capacity to adapt and improvise, including in contact with the enemy, in a way that has confounded the decentralized and poorly motivated Russian forces. So we, um, we need to proceed in real humility here. I've consistently underestimated the um, capacity of the Ukrainians for success. Uh, I regret doing that. I think there could be some big surprises in here they, if they have the confidence to do what they do well and not emulate the tactics of their opponents. Thank you. I'd like to widen from the zoom on Ukraine to more of a panoramic view of Europe as a whole. If we look three to five years down the road, what does the future of Russia in Europe look like? Is the dream of a Europe whole and free still possible? What are Putin's prospects and how will this affect the transatlantic uh, community? Will it be more united? I'd like to start with Sir Alex for the UK perspective, please. Well, look, thank you. And it's, it's a really important question. I say this with regret, first of all, but I think the problem of Russia coming back as a meaningful member of the, of the economic and political community are really dim. And this is a, a tragedy for the Russian people. It's just deserts to the leadership. But if we, if we assume that there will be some kind of diplomatic process eventually, which there probably will be, it's still a very long way to a point where anyone uh, in Europe, for instance, would have the confidence to um, import energy from Russia uh, or trust them in any other way that um, constitutes an adult political relationship. So I think Putin has brought upon his country quasi-pariah status. And I see that enduring for some time um, to come. Europe has also been changed. Now, um, let's be completely honest. Um, uh, Xi Jinping uh, very much enjoyed entertaining President Macron. He got some stand bites that he can have been utterly delighted by, which were readily pounced upon in the US, who understandably um, uh, regard America as taking a disproportionate share of the, uh, of the effort on this war. But I don't think they were representative. The reality in Europe is power has shifted east and north. Um, it's much more um, dictated now by states with direct experience either of living under authoritarian regime or the threat um, of the activities of Russia. And Europe, for all its physical power tendencies, as a result of this war, has found something of a geopolitical identity with it. And NATO has enlarged. So there continue to be justified frustrations on the part of the US um, for um, a, a sort of free riding tendency, which is still there. There's continuing to be in European states a hubris that they can chart a third way and somehow optimize foreign policy for commercial, um, regardless of the risks. But, but I think the vote's going out on that stuff. Our realism is intruding. The kind of, we're discovering that these new postmodern politics that we thought we had are actually very familiar um, and that there is a contest and that there is stuff we have to defend. There are, Europe faces big problems. We are next to Russia. We are energy independent in the way that the United States is. But there are huge strengths there, not least, of course, the quality of the elements 
that we enjoy with the, with the US. So it feels to me like it's a, a different place. And at the very least, I promise you this, there will be no reversion to the status quo as it was before. Putin inadvertently has changed Europe. Ultimately, he's turned it into the sort of place that he said it was when he justified his invasion. So there's an irony for us. Mm, thank you. Secretary Rice. Yes, uh, first um, on the general picture uh, in uh, the transatlantic relationship, I, I just want to second, uh, I think, what uh, uh, Alex said. Uh, not only uh, is Europe transformed, but a lot of the fundamentals are transformed. So, for instance, I think the energy picture will never look the same. And it will never look the same, not only because Europe will never trust Russia, or for a long time will not trust Russia in the way that, for instance, Germany did. But the Russian uh, oil and gas production is going to be fundamentally affected by this war and by the sanctions. We concentrate a lot of times on the fact that they can sell discounted oil to India or discounted oil to China. But if you look at the real possibilities for Russian energy, it rested in being able to revive oil fields in places like the Sakhalin Islands, uh, I was an oil company director, and um, I can tell you that uh, it's really hard to get the technology to do that kind of work. And when the majors pulled out, uh, the, the uh, BPs of the world, the Exxons of the world, uh, they lost that technology. And that technology does not exist in China or in other places. And so they are going to be fundamentally less vibrant energy sector uh, and I think that will change the energy uh, picture. It probably will accelerate Europe's efforts uh, toward um, clean energy, toward uh, getting uh, away from hydrocarbons. For, but for the time being, uh, it's probably going to mean that the uh, Europeans will turn to other sources of hydrocarbons. The Russians will not be it. The other point that I would make is, uh, and this I, I am very sad about, uh, you know, the Russian people had become accustomed to being a part of the world. I was a graduate student in Moscow in 1979. The Soviet people looked at their feet. Uh, they accepted whatever green shoes in size nine were made that year. They didn't travel. In the 30 plus years since the collapse of the Soviet Union, and I would go all the way back over here to Gorbachev, they became accustomed to being a part of the world. They were going to universities outside of Moscow. They were in my classes at Stanford. Uh, they, were, they were founding companies. There was a new Russia being born. And Vladimir Putin has pushed them back to being essentially a large North Korea. And um, I don't think that as long as he's there, Russia is going to be a part of the modern international system. And that's very sad for the Russian people. It does to me say one thing we have to try to do is to try to keep that Russia alive underneath. Now, uh, some 800,000 or more Russians have left the country, 500,000 left right away. They were software engineers, they were entrepreneurs, they were educated people. Uh, another 300,000 or so left when mobilization forces began. But if we can do anything uh, in continuing to have young Russians in our universities, in our companies, uh, maybe the time will come when uh, Russia will finally leave behind its past of 300 awful years of politics. Hmm. Thank you so much. Secretary Panetta. Well, I think it, it's really important to hear to uh, the points that uh, Secretary Rice made because uh, he knows Russia and clearly uh, understands uh, what motivates Russia. I think all of us would hope that we could return to a Russia that would be interested in being able to uh, embrace uh, the international community uh, and to better serve uh, its own people uh, through a better economy and through uh, a better a better ability to uh, give them hope that there is a future for Russia as well. So uh, I, I think, though, she's right that uh, at this point, uh, I don't see Russia changing. Uh, Putin has, uh, uh, has basically built this uh, autocracy in Russia. Uh, and even though Putin's fate 
uh, may not uh, look very good right now. Uh, you know, I, I suspect that Putin is not going to be around in three to five years. But whoever replaces Putin will not change the fundamental policies that Putin's engaged with. I uh, may not may not implement them uh, effectively, but uh, we'll we'll strive to basically seek the same goals that Putin does. So I, I don't think uh, I don't think Putin or his successor is going to be much uh, that much of an issue in terms of impacting on where Europe goes. I think Europe is going to be influenced a lot more by what, what Xi does in China. I think Xi's per fundamental purpose is to divide Europe from the United States. That's what Xi's about. Uh, and uh, the visit with uh, Macron uh, and the continuing efforts by China uh, in Europe uh, are basically designed to try to develop divisions between Europe uh, and, uh, and the United States. So uh, I think that is going to be the bigger threat in terms of uh, our relationship with Europe and Europe's relationship with itself. Uh, I do believe that ultimately in three to five years, what will happen is that the relationship between the United States and NATO will grow stronger. Uh, I think NATO will grow stronger. Uh, I believe uh, Alex is right that uh, uh, that Putin, whose initial goal was to undermine NATO, uh, what has happened is that NATO has been in power. Uh, and that uh, with Finland and then hopefully Sweden uh, and other countries, uh, I assume that ultimately Ukraine will be a part of NATO as well. Uh, I think that relationship will create an even greater bond, a security bond, that will be very important uh, in terms of the unity between the United States and Europe. So I, I see NATO in many ways being the unifying, the unifying element that will uh, give us a better future, not only for Europe, but for the United States and the relationship between the United States and Europe. Uh, I think I think the key is going to rest with how we deal with Xi. That is going to be the challenge for the future, not so much the issue of how we deal with Putin or his successor. Thank you. Secretary Gates. Just make a couple of additional points. Uh, when Condi and I were in the first Bush administration, uh, and we were dealing with the collapse of the Soviet Union and people were talking about a Europe whole and free. We were talking about a Europe whole and free from the Atlantic to the Urals. Uh, the fact is the Europe whole and free will continue, but it will continue without Russia uh, for uh, certainly the foreseeable future. I would also point out that, that Putin, in many respects, has, has hurt Russia in, in extraordinary ways. Uh, for the reasons Condi described, uh, Russia has lost, in effect, a generation of economic growth, development. Uh, it cannot look forward to any kind of Western investment uh, for a long time to come. Uh, it's, it's almost unimaginable to see Putin ever uh, shadowing the door of number 10 Downing Street or the Elysee or, uh, or the White House. Uh, so it truly is a pariah nation. So they've been pushed back economically uh, for a generation. They've lost, as Condi said, so many of their young, promising uh, uh, technical people as well as others. With respect to NATO, uh, Putin has also uh, hurt uh, Russia's long-term interests by strengthening NATO in ways that uh, two years ago I think were almost unimaginable. First of all, the commitments in terms of defense spending on the part of the Europeans on most uh, most NATO nations, but but especially the addition of Finland and probably soon Sweden. These countries bring extraordinary military capabilities to the alliance and essentially make the Baltic a, a NATO lake. So that if his objective, one of his objectives was to weaken NATO, he has done just the opposite. In terms of the final point I'd make is that in terms of the strength of NATO and the U.S.-NATO relationship, in my view, um, the one criterion, the one aspect of this that is critically important and at this point unpredictable 
is whether in 2024 the United States elects a president who embraces the NATO alliance and our alliances and the Article 5 aspect of that alliance. If you have a president who does that, then the prospects are as bright as I think Leon was describing. Uh, if not, uh, then I think I think we have trouble on our hands. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, China's already entered the conversation several times this morning. I'd, I'd like to invite the, the topic to sit at the table with us. Um, the leaders of China and Russia recently proclaimed a friendship without limits, a phrase that maybe sounds better in Russian or Chinese. It doesn't really sound great in, in English. Um, as you look to the future, what do you see as the internal dynamics of this friendship without limits? And how should the Western alliance, the US, the UK, partners and allies manage that. Um, Secretary Panetta, if you would, sir. Well, there's no question that, uh, that Russia and China uh, are going to uh, continue to improve uh, their so-called friendship. Uh, but there's also no question that uh, China is the primary player in that relationship. Uh, you know, uh, Russia is a pariah. Uh, Russia is weakened right now. Uh, Russia has everything to gain by trying to uh, continue to, to work with China. China will continue to talk a good game about uh, supporting Russia. But China's fundamental interest is in itself. That has always been the case for China. Uh, and China is going to focus on improving its economy and improving its position in the world. Uh, through improving its economy. Uh, and so Russia is not going to do anything that will undermine uh, their effort to develop a strong economy for the future. And so I think when it comes to uh, Ukraine, I think China is going to be very careful uh, not to incur the same kind of uh, problems that uh, Russia is facing uh, by suddenly deciding to, to move it to Taiwan and suddenly uh, having economic sanctions uh, and being engaged in a, in, a, in a war in that part of the world. I think she uh, has learned those lessons. Now, obviously, the implication of the relationship between the United States and China, uh, who knows uh, where that's headed or whether or not it can improve, and, and that could result in something that nobody wants. But in the end, I really think that she is, is a smarter player. Uh, and so the one to watch from the point of view of the United States is not so much the uh, relationship between China and Russia. I think the, the bigger play is what is she going to do in order to achieve his goal of ultimately replacing the United States as a world leader? Uh, that's what we need to keep our eyes on, because I think that's the bigger threat for the future. Mm, thank you. Sir Alex, your perspective? Well, look, I think um, uh, I think this has been three phases. So fundamentally, uh, Xi Jinping, he, he, um, uh, he is combined with Vladimir Putin and a strong view of the world he doesn't want, which is our world. So you get an axis of autocracy, with, which whilst it has little in common, and indeed a great history of rivalry, is fundamentally joined um, in interest in the repudiation of the US-led world system. And that is pretty powerful. Um, I think Xi Jinping as an ideologue finds it pretty attractive. But I think he was also, uh, he would feel he was underinformed at the famous lunch during the Winter Olympics when Vladimir Putin allegedly told him what he was going to do. I'm confident that the risks of this campaign would have been minimized uh, and he'd have felt done over. And um, um, as Leon's saying, I think they are now in a much more cautious frame of mind um, to hark back to the last question, they are indeed intent in carving off the US from, um, from uh, Europe uh, as part of their grand strategy. Um, they, um, they've, they've, it's a problem. Two things have happened. One, Ukraine has pulled Europe much more firmly back into the US. But two, um, they're presenting um, as a problem on Ukraine with their apparently unstinted support for Russia. And there's been some quite interesting diplomatic work to try to sort of retrofit that position which is unbelievable at one level, um, but does represent a much more cautious approach on the part of China. So with that in mind, I would, um, with humility, um, uh, predict that they won't take the uh, 
uh, extremely foolish step of um, upping uh, arms transfers to um, Ukraine in a way that would make us to Russia to make, that would make a strategic difference. And then finally, I would say this, though, I don't think there's any scope for being relaxed. China's approach to alliances may look risible from our perspective, transactional, self-serving. But the global security initiative, they moot um, uh, China as a defender of developing nations against the bullying of the West, etc., falls on more fertile ground than any of us, I suspect, in this audience would actually like to consider. And along with some deft sort of debt and um, BRL activity, it is cutting through. And I don't think we should be dismissive of, of China's capacity to, um, to assert its view of the world beyond its borders in a way that, you know, we, we, we would not welcome. Thank you. Secretary Gates. Sure, and thank you. Um, it seems to me that, first of all, we have to appreciate the magnitude of, of the strategic change that has taken place. One of the uh, great achievements of President Nixon and uh, Henry Kissinger was changing the global structure in a way that be because of their outreach to uh, China in 1971-72 and uh, detente around the same time with the Soviet Union was that the United States had a better relationship with each of the other two main powers than they had with each other. And and what we have seen in the last few years is a reversal of that situation in which the United States is the outlier among those three major powers uh, where you have the other two uh, cooperating with each other. So I think we shouldn't underestimate the, the significance of that strategic shift from uh, 50 years ago uh, from a, a, an environment that actually prevailed uh, for uh, for. Uh, some 35 or 40 years. Uh, I think in that context, um, the, one of the things about this partnership, and, and Sir Alex referred to it, is, is this notion that the two have in common, let's leave aside uh, support for Ukraine, the notion that, the, or the strategy of overturning the post-war uh, structures that were put in place and the, the post-war system dominated by institutions created by the, uh, largely with the United States in the in lead. They want to overthrow that system. The, the, and there's a certain division of labor between the two countries. The Russians in their communications are basically the spoiler. They're the ones that go in and try and create problems inside the democracies, between the democracies, and so on. At the same time, the Chinese main message is we have an alternative model of economic growth uh, and development that for all of you uh, authoritarians out there uh, offers the opportunity to develop your country uh, without uh, pesky questions from the United States and its allies about human rights and, and so on. So they are working together in this respect. So the Ukraine aspect is certainly important. And, and I agree with Sir Alex. I think the Chinese have been pretty careful about uh, what they um, about the limits on the limitless partnership in the sense that I suspect they will not send uh, flat out weaponry. They will. They are doing a lot in terms of semiconductors and so on uh, to help the, the Russians, but I think they will refrain from sending weapons uh, because they don't want to take the risk of secondary sanctions from the United States. But but I think it's in terms of you've spoken, Tom, in terms of grand strategy. I think it's important to recognize that the the change in the situation that we have seen strategically uh, and and then how do we counter that down the road? Thank you. Secretary Rice. Well, uh, I, I think that the analysis that my colleagues have put forward is one with which I would associate. But let me take a little bit of a different tack <laughs> and talk about why this might not work from China's point of view. Um, I, I definitely think that uh, the Russians and the Chinese, their friendship without limits is really about undermining U.S. power. That's, that's very clear. Uh, and if we're not careful, we will help them. Uh, and I'll return to that. Uh, but if you, if you look at uh, what I think has been an adjustment in Chinese foreign policy over the last year or so, 
Uh, we went from wolf warrior diplomacy, where we were calling Australia gum under the shoe of China, where we were going to uh, a border that had been quiet on the Indian uh, border and beating up Indian soldiers with baseball bats, um, where we were uh, carrying to the, to the limits the idea that the Belt and Road uh, loans had to be repaid, no matter how heavily endowed it. And so it was a kind of aggressive uh, policy based really just kind of on power. I do think that they've made an interesting shift to something that looks more like, now I'm the great diplomat, Mr. Xi Jinping. I can go to uh, the Middle East and I can make peace between Saudi Arabia and uh, Iran. Um, I can put forward a peace proposal on Ukraine and I can have a phone call with uh, the Ukrainian president. I can welcome um, President Macron in the Great Hall of the People. You've seen the shift from, you know, we will beat you up if you don't agree with us, to, uh, oh, we, we really have a great face of kindness uh, toward the world. You know, it, it may play, it may not, uh, because uh, underneath, there seems to me to be some confusion about this in the Chinese diplomatic uh, circles. So uh, the Chinese ambassador of the EU says, well, that relationship about limits, you know, that was just rhetoric. Uh, I, I think they're, they've got to get their act together. Uh, you know, being a great power, being a global power is actually hard. And I think they're actually starting to find out that being a global power is actually hard. Now, I don't underestimate uh, their ability to carry something, some of this off. The other thing, but but let's remember uh, that there have been some missteps uh, along the way. You know, zero COVID didn't do them much good internationally either. Uh, I would also note that they have some real demerits at home. Uh, they have just been passed by India in terms of population. That uh, whenever I hear people with what I call uh, authoritarian envy, you know, oh, they build great airports. Oh, they're so strategic. I say uh, just a few words, the one child policy. And now 34 million Chinese men don't have mates. And so authoritarians tend to make mistakes and push it too far. Now we can help that in a couple of ways. Uh, the Chinese have clients. We actually have allies. And if we are smart in the way that we deal with the Quad, that we deal with India, where I don't think we need to have any loyalty test for anybody. You know, uh, Americans can be a little bit, um, it's either us or them. Well, this isn't the time to do that. Let the global South find its, uh, its um, non-aligned status. And I think if we don't push our message too far, if we pay attention to our own knitting, if we pay attention to our defense industrial base, if we pay attention to the strengthening of NATO, uh, we'll be in an actually pretty good place uh, to deal with a China that has a lot of problems at home. I might just add that Xi Jinping uh, in his, no, I'll take, if I have to choose between economic liberalization and political control, I'll take political control. Uh, they effectively for a while destroyed the goose that go laid the golden eggs, which were their private companies like the Alibabas and the 10 cents of the world. Now it's, oh, come on back. We didn't mean it. Jack Ma, please come back from Tokyo. I don't know how much those entrepreneurs and others are going to believe it. They were leading the world for a while in online education. They shut it all down. So my point isn't that China isn't going to succeed. It's that we have a lot of arrows in our quiver to make sure that they don't succeed easily. And here I would go back to Bob's point about the American elections. If we have an American president who understands what the United States needs to do at home, what the United States needs to do with its allies, and how the United States needs to act in the world, I think we're more than capable of standing up to China's challenge. Mm, thank you. I'd like to focus on a very hot button issue here in Washington today, and that is the U.S.'s long policy of strategic ambiguity when it comes to Taiwan. President Biden has made a number of comments that are uh, less than ambiguous. So if you were called to, to the sit room tomorrow, if you were called to number 10 Downing, what would you advise American policy to be on strategic am ambiguity and specifically should the U.S. say it will come to the defense of Taiwan in the case of attack? Secretary Gates. I think that we need to uh, adhere as closely as we can to the arrangements that were put together in the 1970s and the agreements with 
kind of both sides in some ways have changed the goalposts of the Chinese by their aggressive military actions in the South China Sea and the Taiwan trade and around Taiwan, uh, ours by uh, increasing political, uh, senior level political uh, interactions with, you know, with the Taiwanese. My view is that we should retain the strategic ambiguity in part because it's very difficult to know how things will develop in the future. If you abandon uh, strategic ambiguity, do you give heart to those in Taiwan who would want to declare independence uh, because they have a guarantee the United States would come to their assistance? It seems to me that, uh, that, that the better course is, is to significantly strengthen our military capabilities in the region and to make clear that we are able to defend Taiwan or come to Taiwan's defense in a way that uh, assures Chinese failure should they launch a military attack on Taiwan. Um, so I think preserving our flexibility in terms of, of unforeseeable circumstances is preferable to locking ourselves into a position of, of, uh, of having to go to war uh, regardless of of the circumstances. So my, my view would be, my, my, my view in that situation room would be, uh, let's, let's stick with where we have been. Uh, I think all of the, you know, the pol politics around Taiwan and the Congress and the White House suggest to the Chinese very strongly that we would come to Taiwan's assistance. So let, let it ride there and provide significant military capabilities so that the Chinese have to know that should we make that decision, they will lose. Thank you. Secretary Rice, your thoughts. I would say that I, I think the way we've managed the Taiwan, uh, the, this cross-straits uh, relationship over the last many years has actually worked pretty well, and I wouldn't have undermined it. Um, I probably would go back to strategic ambiguity, but once that cat's out of the bag, it's a little hard to, to go back, particularly since the president said it four times, uh, not once. You know, once might have been uh, an accident, twice might have been an accident, three and four weren't. Um, and I wonder a little bit at the rationale, because the U.S. has always been kind of, as Bob, I think, was describing, kind of the rheostat in this. Uh, if the Chinese were out of control, we dialed the Chinese back. If so Taiwan was talking too much about independence, as they did during the time of Chen Shui-bian when we were in office. We dialed them back because we recognize that what we have in uh, the Taiwan situation is what I often call in the international system, uh, it's a device. Uh, it's not really satisfying to anybody, but it holds things in place until situation can change peacefully. So... Uh, you know, in, in many ways, the, the division of Germany was a device for 40 plus years. And then eventually we were able to see an underlying circumstance that changed. And so I kind of liked this device uh, that said uh, neither side should change the status quo. Um, it may well be now that uh, with the president's statements, uh, we are in the position that everybody knows we will defend Taiwan. I think now it is even more incumbent on us, therefore, to make sure that that doesn't mean that the United States has to do things that we're not capable of doing or willing to do. And so strengthening Taiwan, deterrence becomes a major issue. Uh, we need to think differently about what uh, moving from strategic ambiguity means for us, because I, I think I would agree with Bob in the situation. I certainly would have argued for it. But with the president having said this four times, um, I, I think the Chinese probably aren't listening if they want to go, if we want to go back. Thank you. Secretary Panetta. Well, I would, I would concur with my uh, colleagues that uh, a strategic uh, ambiguity, uh, whatever that means, uh, or the one China policy, uh, remains a very important bridge to try to be able to continue a dialogue between the United States and China with regards to this issue. So uh, I think it is important uh, to try to maintain uh, that position from the past. Uh, having said that, I think we also have to understand the realities of the moment. The realities are that with China 
indicating a more aggressive posture towards Taiwan, that it was important for the United States to make clear uh, that uh, we would not walk away from our responsibilities. Uh, and the president, you know, whether one agrees or disagrees with what the president said, I'm a believer that once the president says, says something, uh, he, the president's got to stick to it uh, in order to protect our own credibility uh, in the world. And so having said that, uh, I think that we do have to try to make sure that we develop as much deterrence as possible uh, with Taiwan, provide them with the weapons, provide them with the training that they need uh, in order to make clear to China that uh, this is not going to be a pushover if they decide to go into Taiwan. So I, I think we're kind of, we're, we're basically going to ride two horses at one time. One is, yes, we're going to continue this uh, strategic ambiguity. Yes, we're, we're a one China uh, country that recognizes one China rule. Uh, we're going to continue to try to discuss things with China on that basis. But at the same time, we're making very clear that uh, the signal is that China should not uh, try to uh, turn Taiwan into Ukraine uh, and try to take advantage of another uh, democracy. Uh, and that the United States will respond if necessary, if that happens. Thank you. Sir Alex, your thoughts. Well, uh, briefly, a couple of things. First of all, I completely agree with Bob that um, uh, intentions can change overnight, but capabilities change more slowly. And um, it's vital that the capabilities exist to hold an invasion that threat, almost regardless of the answer to your question. Secondly, if I can speak as a transatlanticist and an affectionate outsider, um, it, the policy doesn't sound like ambiguity, it sounds like uncertainty. And I fear that that's escalatory, because what, what, it, what it looks like is, is that the US hasn't really decided what it would do. And that could embolden those who would seek to exploit that time. Now, I'm not saying that's happened, but I, I think there is a difference between ambiguity and uncertainty. And I think what would be good is to see the sort of message discipline in place that would um, make this about ambiguity, rather than evidently a reflection of some pretty deep disagreements in Washington. Thank you. Um, in my 40 years as a daily journalist, I never missed a deadline. We're under 10 minutes now, and I promise our hosts who organized this amazing uh, seminar today that I would end on time. So I do have one final question for all the panelists, a bit more on, on the personal, but still professional. I did the math last night, and among the four of you, there's more than 150 years of national security experience. Spanish. <laughs> You can, you can do the division by four. I'll just leave, I'll leave it at that. You know, your career span the Cold War, your career span the global war on terror, and lots of other issues as well. If you are, I would like to hear your assessment on how bad are things today? In this new age of danger we find ourselves in, how does it compare to all of the decades that you've, you've served? What are the essential tools you think our country should save? Leadership has come up several times. What else? And finally, are you optimistic or pessimistic? Secretary Panetta, please. Well, I, I, I've said this uh, a number of times. I think uh, we're living in a very dangerous world uh, where there are a lot of flashpoints, uh, probably more flashpoints uh, than what we've seen since World War II. Uh, and, and the flashpoints are all obvious. Uh, we're confronting one of those flashpoints with Russia uh, in the Ukraine right now. Uh, we're con we have a war in Europe that's going on that will in many ways decide not just what happens with democracy in the Ukraine, but what happens with democracy in the 21st century. Uh, we're dealing with China uh, and uh, the difficulties of trying to figure out uh, that relationship, uh, whether it's one of competition or whether it's an adversarial relationship, probably both. Uh, but it's one that we're going to have to deal with uh, because it, it does threaten peace in the world as well. Uh, we're dealing with North Korea and the, and the fact that uh, North Korea now has the potential to basically strike targets not only in the Pacific but in the United States. And the same thing is true for Iran, uh, which now has the potential to develop a nuclear weapon uh, within a few weeks because of the amount of enriched fuel that it's had. Uh, if you add cyber to that, uh, all of those uh, issues, cyber being the battlefield of the future, uh, we, ha we have a number of uh, 
neighborhood of danger points that are out there. And so the real question for the United States is, uh, how do we approach these challenges? I think that the United States is going to have to develop alliances uh, in each of these areas to be able to uh, secure against these danger points. Uh, we've done it with NATO. Obviously, NATO is a good example of a strong alliance uh, that is unified and that has come together to assist uh, Ukraine in their war against Russia. Uh, I think that it's a great example of how uh, countries can work together to protect uh, the peace uh, in uh, certainly that part of the world. I think we need to build alliances in the Middle East, uh, stronger alliances with modern Arab countries, with Israel, uh, in order to confront both Iran and the continuing threat from terrorism. That's another danger point, very frankly, is that terrorism still remains a threat to the world. So I do think we need to build a stronger alliance within the Middle East. And I think the same thing is true for the Pacific, our ability to build alliances with the ASEAN countries, with the Quad, with India, with South Korea, with Japan. I think that is going to be fundamental ingredient that allows us to be able to confront China, uh, whether it's on security issues or economic issues. Uh, and we need to do that elsewhere as well. That's gonna require a great deal of leadership by the United States. We have to be a world leader. We cannot withdraw from our role as world leader in the world. And if we continue that role, and if the next president of the United States continues the role of the United States as a world leader, then I'm confident that, uh, that the future will be one in which democracies not only will survive, but thrive. Thank you. Secretary Rice. Um, I would say that the, the, the three things that worry me uh, are, first of all, the kind of weakness of the international system at this point, the international order, if you will, because uh, it feels more like the 19th century than the 20th and 21st, uh, late 20th and 21st. Um, we, we do have strong regional alliances, but, you know, the, the Security Council is essentially moribund at this point. Uh, the World Trade Organization I don't think we're going to have another round uh, for a very, very long time to come. And a kind of liberal international order that more or less kept the peace and made us more prosperous seems to be praying very, very badly. COVID was the revenge of the sovereign state, uh, not the response of the international community. And that worries me. Great power rivalry worries me. The United States has a rival in China that we've never had one before that was so integrated into the international economy, into the international system. Uh, but was our equal or will be our equal in terms of technology, military power, and economic power. The Soviet Union was a military giant that was an economic and technological midget. That is not China. Uh, third, I worry about the state of the United States itself. Uh, you know, we seem to be pulling ourselves apart um, in desperate ways because I think too many Americans really don't believe that the American dream is for them any longer. We've got to attend to that. But the sources for me of uh, optimism start with uh, a scary point. The technologies that we're seeing, AI, quantum others, but particularly AI, has the potential to transform for good or for bad. Uh, when you think of what this innovation could mean for healthcare, for education, it's really exciting. And I live in the Silicon Valley and technology is kind of always good. Actually, technology is neutral. And human beings have been a lot better at the knowledge part than the wisdom part. So can we really harness these technologies instead of turn them again into weapons of conflict and war? Uh, but I'm optimistic, and I'm optimistic in part, I'll close here on a, on a personal note. I'm optimistic because I live in a great university, and I teach these kids every day. And while they get a kind of bad rap, they never are off their phones and all kinds of things, and it is true, uh, they're never off their phones. Uh, they are the most public-minded generation that I've taught in 40 years. They want to do things bigger than themselves. They are in a hurry. They don't always have their facts right. Uh, they really do think that they're going to be whispering in the ear of the senator in their first jobs. But if we can channel some of that energy with teaching and with giving them experiences with people that they would otherwise not meet, through national service, through Teach for America or the like, I think they are going to be extraordinary in what they can do. And so that's really my source of optimism. Thank you. Sir Alex. 
Look, as a spy for 30 years, I'm, I'm not paid to be optimistic, so I, I can <laughs> That's why you're on the panel, sir. <laughs> so, of course, I need to associate myself with a lot of the problems that have been so eloquently described. But let me give you a cause for optimism. Uh, 2022, which in some ways, probably, must be seen as a terrible time. Um, but then look at the corollary. So, first of all, uh, at the beginning of 2022, it looked like um, COVID was a use case for authoritarianism. But through ingenuity and a technological creativity, it turned out that we have the answer. Our distributed innovative society for the ones that defeated COVID, not zero. Secondly, there was a insurrection in Iran put down with characteristic brutality by the regime. But this time it was led by women and girls, and it was very evident there was nothing in the authoritarian people capable of dealing with an insurrection of this fight. And I believe we have not seen, um, seen the end of that. And then thirdly, as we've discussed at length, uh, Vladimir Putin, the global nuclear power bully, epically miscalculated. He believed that we would roll over and forget what we were for in the face of his aggression. So I know it's a huge amount to be concerned about. It feels more uncertain than open than at any time. But um, those are big data points as far as I'm concerned and signposts for the future. Mm, thank you. The final word, Secretary Gates. Uh, thanks, Tom. And, and first of all, as a career intelligence officer, I would have to uh, align myself with Sir Alex. Uh, I am sort of inherent pessimistic. Uh, that's kind of what I was trained to be. Um, and we are, as Leon said, living, uh, I think, in probably the most uh, unpredictable period uh, since the late 1940s with a lot of very big uh, uh, moves in, in process, whether it's China or Russia, Iran, North Korea, uh, and so on. Uh, that said, it seems to me that uh, all, all those things taken into account that that there are some very powerful things <clears throat> uh, in our favor. One is uh, is our alliance. This, this is this is unique for the United States, uh, um, and certainly Russia and China, as Condi I think said, uh, have clients but not allies. And our and our uh, allies bring real power, bring real strength, uh, both economic and uh, military, and I would add uh, political. I guess the I guess the where I come out is that um, if I had a choice of whether to play our hand or play Xi Jinping's hand, I would take our hand any day. Uh, we have a lot of challenges that have to be managed, uh, and 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 the question the, the big question mark is whether we have the leaders who can manage those problems, they are manageable. We've managed big problems in the past. The question is whether we have leaders who can do that today. But in terms of, of our economy, in terms of, uh, of the innovativeness of, uh, of the American people and freedom that's offered for entrepreneurs and others, I just think we have a lot of advantages uh, uh, as, as we look ahead, however daunting uh, the challenges. And the final point I'd make, Tom, you asked, what are the tools uh, that work uh, that are important? One of the things that characterized our success in the Cold War, and I would say uh, in our success against terrorism, was broad bipartisan uh, support. Uh, in the Cold War, we had nine successive presidents that embraced essentially the same basic strategy on how to deal with the Soviet Union. So, so bipartisanship in, in moving forward is going to be critically important, and not kind of in some ways uh, the uh, undifferentiated uh, bipartisanship that we're seeing with China right now, where nobody in Congress wants to be seen to be more uh, uh, dovish on China than anybody else, but but I think I think bipartisanship is the act, actual key because it provides for continuity uh, and predictability in American policy, and that's essential 
particularly as we deal with our allies and friends, but also our potential rivals and adversaries. Mm. Thank you. And with that, I'll offer a heartfelt thanks to our four panelists for a thoughtful and thought-provoking discussion. Thanks to all of you for being there and to the organizers today. Thank you. And we were right on time. <laughs>